How lethal is COVID-19 compared to other causes of untimely death? Let's look at just facts. In keeping with Just Facts' mission to equip people with comprehensive, straightforward, and rigorously documented facts, this video provides a trove of data about COVID-19 and its impacts. This includes some vital facts from highly credible sources that have been absent or misreported in much of the media's coverage of this issue. It also includes a groundbreaking study to determine the lethality of COVID-19 based on the most comprehensive available measure, the total years of life it will rob from all people. Dr. Andrew Glenn, West Point Professor Emeritus and award-winning researcher in the academic field of computational probability, describes this research as excellent and spot-on. He also writes, thank you for your thoughtful analysis, as not many people understand the basic statistical measures that truly inform this issue. We'll dig into the details in a moment, but here's the overview. On one hand, the facts show that the death rate for people who contract COVID-19 is uncertain, but is probably closer to that of the seasonal flu than figures commonly reported by the press. The average years of life lost from each COVID-19 death are significantly fewer than from common causes of untimely death, like accidents and suicides. The virus that causes COVID-19 is very vulnerable to antibody neutralization and has limited ability to mutate, which means it is very unlikely to take masses of lives year after year like the flu and other recurring scourges. If 240,000 COVID-19 deaths ultimately occur in the United States, the virus will rob about 2.9 million years of life from all Americans who were alive at the outset of 2020 while the flu will rob them of about 35 million years, suicides will rob them of 132 million years, and accidents will rob them of about 409 million years, or about 140 times more than COVID-19. On the other hand, elderly people and those with chronic ailments are extremely vulnerable to COVID-19. Furthermore, the disease is highly transmissible, meaning it can spread like wildfire and overwhelm hospitals without extraordinary measures to contain it. This would greatly increase its death toll. However, precautionary measures can often have economic and other impacts that can also cost lives, and overreacting can ultimately kill more people than are saved. Now the specifics. Roughly 100,000 U.S. residents have died from COVID-19 as of late May. To put this figure in perspective, COVID-19 has killed about one out of every 3,000 Americans, whereas about one out of every 100 Americans dies every year. An average of 37,000 people in the U.S. have died from influenza, the flu, each year over the past nine years. Around 170,000 people per year in the U.S. die from accidents. In other words, deaths from COVID-19 are roughly half of the annual fatalities from the flu and accidents. Although COVID-19 is a new disease and took its first reported life in the U.S. during late February, this comparison may substantially overstate the relative deadliness of COVID-19 because fatalities from accidents and the flu occur in droves every year, and this is unlikely for COVID-19. The primary reason why the flu takes tens of thousands of lives every year is because the viruses that cause it mutate in ways that prevent people from becoming immune to them. Now, all viruses mutate, but influenza remains highly unusual among infectious diseases because it mutates very rapidly and thus new vaccines are needed almost every year to protect against it. While much remains to be seen about the virus that causes COVID-19, the early indications are that it will not mutate rapidly and become an ongoing scourge. Thus, once a vaccine for COVID-19 is developed, it would not need regular updates, unlike seasonal influenza vaccines, because the part of the virus that the vaccine targets is protected against mutation by a proofreading function in its genetic material, or RNA. The same point applies to naturally acquired immunity. People who get COVID-19 develop antibodies that protect against future infections of it. Such immunity, which is called active immunity, is generally long-lasting. The same applies to diseases like measles, mumps, rubella, and polio. If someone contracts these diseases, they rarely get them again, and furthermore, they are very unlikely to transmit them to others. Thus, these people become firewalls against the spread of these contagions. 
Because COVID-19 doesn't mutate nearly as much as the flu, it is far less likely to take lives regardless of acquired immunity and vaccines. If this proves true in the long run, as current evidence suggests that it will, this means the lifetime risk of dying from COVID-19 is greatly overstated by comparing its ultimate death toll to yearly fatalities from the flu, suicides, accidents, and other frequent causes of death. Beyond raw numbers of deaths, another crucial factor in measuring the deadliness of a public health threat is the ages of its victims. In the words of the CDC, the allocation of health resources must consider not only the number of deaths by cause, but also by age. Hence, the years of potential life lost has become a mainstay in the evaluation of the impact of injuries on public health. In this respect, COVID-19 is much less lethal than common causes of untimely death such as accidents. The precise age of death for COVID-19 fatalities is still unknown, but the vast majority of its victims are elderly or have one or more chronic diseases, as is the case with deaths from the flu and pneumonia. The average age of death for accidents is about 53.3 years, while for the flu and pneumonia it is about 77.4 years. Using flu and pneumonia as a rough proxy for COVID-19, this disease robs an average of 12 years of life from each of its victims, as compared to 30.6 years of life lost for each accident. In late March, Dr. Deborah Burks, a world-renowned immunologist, presented a model projecting 100,000 to 240,000 deaths in the U.S. from COVID-19 if Americans follow social distancing and hygiene guidelines. Even if the high end of that range comes to pass, this disease will rob 2.9 million years of life from all Americans who were alive at the outset of 2020. In comparison, the flu will rob them of about 35 million years, and accidents will rob them of 409 million years. These figures reveal that accidents are about 140 times more lethal to Americans than this worst-case scenario for COVID-19, given mitigation. Likewise, the flu is 12 times as lethal. This is a substantially more comprehensive measure of deadliness than a tally of lives lost during a year or any other random unit of time because it takes into account the entirety of people's lives and the total years of life that they lose. Without diminishing the value of any life, these facts speak to the efforts that society makes to save some lives versus others. But for people who catch COVID-19, what are the odds that it will kill them? Initial media reports of a 2 to 3 percent mortality rate for COVID-19 are inflated, and the actual figure may be closer to that of the flu, which has averaged about 0.15 percent over the past nine years in the United States. As explained by Dr. Brett Joa, the COVID-19 death rate is lower than you heard probably in many reports because the bulk of people who get coronavirus don't get seriously ill, and thus many of them never get tested. Jura calls this a denominator problem because if you're not very ill, as most people are not, they do not get tested. They do not get counted in the denominator. Jura's best estimate is that the mortality rate is probably somewhere between 0.1% and 1%. This is likely more severe in its mortality rate than the typical flu rate, but it's certainly within the range. A prime example of how journalists misreport on this issue is a March 12th article in Business Insider by Andy Kears. In this piece, he compares the death rates of COVID-19 from the South Korean CDC to that of the flu from the United States CDC. Based on these numbers, he reports that South Korea, which has reported some of the lowest coronavirus death rates of any country, still has a COVID-19 death rate more than eight times higher than that of the flu. What Kears and his editors fail to understand is that the denominator for the Korean rate is the number of confirmed cases, while the denominator for the U.S. rate is based on a mathematical model. The CDC clarifies how the model works by citing a study on the swine flu, which multiplies 43,677 laboratory-confirmed cases of the disease by 41 to 131 times to calculate the denominator for the death rate, figuring that confirmed cases are likely a substantial underestimate of the true number. Put simply, COVID-19 death rates that are based on reported or confirmed infections grossly undercount the number of people with the disease. This, in turn, makes the death rate seem substantially higher than reality. Another factor that can create the same false impression is social media. 
Due to that and other modern technologies for communicating, the average number of acquaintances separating any two people in the world has declined from 6 to 3.9 in recent years. Each American now knows an average of 550 people and has about 220,000 friends of friends and 88 million friends of friends of friends. Thus, if everyone is sharing on social media about people they know who have been infected or killed by COVID-19, it can seem like the world is coming to an end. Yet if people did the same for other deaths, each person would hear every year about an average of 1,905 deaths among their friends of friends and 761,844 deaths among their friends of friends of friends, 38 deaths from the flu and pneumonia among their friends of friends, and 15,075 such deaths among their friends of friends of friends. In addition to social media, the press acts as a megaphone of COVID-19's impacts. Because the United States is the third most populous nation in the world, it's easy for journalists to create misleading impressions by focusing on certain events and ignoring the broader context of the facts that surround them. All that is not to say that COVID-19 isn't dangerous, because another important factor in weighing the risks of this disease is its transmissibility, or how contagious it is. In this respect, COVID-19 is much more dangerous than the seasonal flu because it spreads very quickly and can overwhelm hospitals. Scientists measure the contagiousness of diseases with a basic reproduction number, which is the average number of people who catch it from each person who has it. This is an innate characteristic of the disease because it doesn't account for actions that people take to prevent it. Early research finds that the basic reproduction number for COVID-19 will likely prove to be around 2 to 3 after more data are accumulated. In contrast, the basic reproduction number for the seasonal flu is about 1.3. The seemingly small difference between 1.3 and higher figures like 1.8 represent the differences between epidemics that are controllable and cause moderate illness and those causing a significant number of illnesses and requiring intensive mitigation strategies to control. Given the high transmissibility of COVID-19, the aggressive measures that some governments, organizations, and individuals have taken to limit large gatherings and travel from areas with outbreaks will save many more lives than doing the same for common diseases like the flu. Because COVID-19 spreads so quickly, it can easily overwhelm hospitals and thereby prevent people from getting the care they would otherwise receive under normal circumstances. That said, there are mortal dangers in overreacting because measures to limit the spread of COVID-19 often have economic impacts that can cost lives. Countries with low economic growth are less able to satisfy basic needs for food, shelter, clothing, education, and health. These hazards can manifest quickly and over extended periods of time. If certain industries adopted the social distancing extremes that many people have embraced, this would shut down food production and distribution, healthcare, utilities, and other life-sustaining services. Even under far more moderate scenarios where people not in these industries shun work, all of those necessities and many other aspects of modern life are dependent on the general strength of the economy. Thus, overreacting can ultimately kill more people than are saved. The same applies to people who flooded supermarkets to stockpile food, toilet paper, and other supplies. In doing so, they often stood in close proximity to each other and touched the same items, which opens avenues to spread the disease. Panic buying also creates shortages that deprive typical consumers of provisions. Likewise, panic can fuel suicides, which snuff out about 47,000 lives per year in the U.S. at an average age of 46 years old. Over a lifetime, that amounts to 132 million lost years of life or 46 times the loss from COVID-19 if it ultimately kills 240,000 people. The implications of overreacting to COVID-19 or any other potential hazard are aptly summarized in a teaching guide published by the American Society for Microbiology. The factors driving your concept of risk, emotion or fact, may or may not seem particularly important to you, yet they are, because there are risks in misperceiving risks. What about solutions to COVID-19? Aggressive social distancing can extend the time frame over which COVID-19 patients are infected and hospitalized, but it cannot by itself reduce those outcomes in the long run. That's because the disease is so contagious that another outbreak will begin and quickly proliferate as soon as social distancing measures cease. 
Hence, the Imperial College states that in order to avoid a rebound in transmission, policies of population-wide social distancing combined with home isolation of cases and school and university closure must be maintained until large stocks of vaccine are available to immunize the population, which could be 18 months or more. Moreover, the more successful a strategy is at temporary suppression, the larger the later epidemic is predicted to be in the absence of vaccination due to lesser buildup of herd immunity. To underscore the importance of that point, when a sufficiently high proportion of individuals within a population becomes immune, either through prior exposure or through mass vaccination, community or herd immunity emerges, whereby individuals that are poorly immunized are protected by the collective immune firewall provided by immunized neighbors. Equally, if very few people are immune to a disease, they can transmit it to others instead of blocking it. Without a vaccine, the only way people can become immune to COVID-19 is by catching it and recovering. And so too much social distancing may actually cause more deaths because otherwise young, healthy people who would catch the disease, recover quickly, and become firewalls instead remain as potential carriers. However, social distancing can keep hospitalizations at reasonable levels so that victims receive proper care. And it can also buy time to discover and mass produce effective treatments. This is a distinct possibility in the short term because the same physical feature of the virus that makes it so contagious also makes it very vulnerable to antibody neutralization, and thus it is a relatively easy virus to protect against. President Trump has touted a small French study showing that treatment with a combination of two drugs, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, is significantly associated with viral load reduction and disappearance in COVID-19 patients. The study was published in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents, and the 18 scholars who authored it wrote that the results are promising and we recommend that COVID-19 patients be treated with these drugs to cure their infection and to limit the transmission of the virus to other people. Nonetheless, the story media outlets find in all this is that Trump is not a doctor and shouldn't hype unproven and untested treatments or give people false hope. Theatrics aside, the FDA has issued an emergency use authorization that allows doctors to treat certain hospitalized COVID-19 patients with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine when a clinical trial is not available or feasible. The authors of the French study make clear that their study has some limitations, including a small sample size, limited long-term outcome follow-up, and drop out of six patients from the study. However, in the current context, we believe that our results should be shared with the scientific community. During a March 14th press conference, U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams asserted that this situation will last longer and more people will be hurt if we are complacent, selfish, uninformed, and if we spread fear, distrust, and misinformation. Conversely, he said that we will overcome this situation if we pitch in and share the facts. This video provides vitally important facts from credible primary sources, but many media outlets have failed to report them, or worse yet, falsely claimed the exact opposite. So now it's up to you to share these facts with others so that more people are not hurt. I'm Amanda Reed Sheik, here with Just Facts. For thorough documentation of every fact in this video and other facts about this issue and daily updates on the latest COVID-19 data, read the article Crucial Facts About COVID-19 at JustFacts.com.